Who's that man? You look too serious. This is Happy Monday. <laughs> I know it needs to relax, right? Madame Hello, Vic Madam CEO. Good to hear your voice. <laughs> yes. Welcome, 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 everybody. Welcome to another Medical Mondays with Dr. O. What an amazing day, amazing season, amazing time. Today, we are going to continue with this so very important subject of lifestyle change. We are going to be talking about the nitty gritty of what we really need, we, we really need to be eating and why we should be doing that. I am Dr. Toyin Okwesomi, a family practitioner, HIV specialist, and I also treat substance abuse or substance use disorder. Some people will call it addiction anyone we want to call it. Um, I enjoy just sharing medical knowledge with the intention of helping us prevent disease entities. It's always better to prevent than to try to, to cure. So tonight, I hope we will learn more moving forward to help us in that quest where we can have a stronger health, for a stronger future. So I give you our very own Dr. Masha Gillum, our own naturopath who will educate us tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. It's still afternoon here in California, it's still light outside. <laughs> so I'm enjoying a little bit left of the daylight here. Um, it's interesting the subject that we're going to. Uh, talk about and and feel free to, I'm not the, a lecturer so just feel free to jump in with your comments and your um, questions and we have all these experts here on the floor with me to uh, answer questions and to uh, in, interject because uh, we're going to be talking about the issues with the western diet and the problem is, is what I, as I was thinking about it, is that it's not just the Western diet. This diet has infiltrated all over the world. When I went to Israel, there was a Burger King. Almost every place I've been, there are fast food restaurants. And that fast food mindset has infiltrated internationally. And it's more prevalent here in the United States because you know, we have more transportation, easy, easy, easy transportation to get to and fro to where we want to go. But even in Ghana, they have fast food restaurants. Uh, I saw a uh, country, uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken within walking distance of the hotel that I was staying in Sacramento. So they have fast food places all over the world. And the problem is, is the effects that it's having on not just us as people that are trying to have a healthy lifestyle. There's a big effect on our children. You see children with obesity. You see children that are, they, they're nine months old and they look like they're three years old because of the diet that they're on, the fast food and high hormone diet. Um, and because of that, high demand for this type of food even in our kitchens you know we we have a kind of a fast food mindset and that we want to hurry up and fix something uh, a tv dinner or a frozen dinner that we can just stick in the microwave and you know be done in 10 seconds 15 seconds i don't know how long does it take to cook a, a, a fast food dinner 30 seconds be done in 30 seconds so that we can hurry up and eat to do what? Go sit down, be sedentary, watch TV or whatever other things that we have to entertain ourselves. So that fast food mentality, microwave mentality and the I want it now mentality or need it now or feel we need it now mentality is permeated into our households and is affecting our children. So one of the things you know, that came to mind is 
a safety issue. Because I live in California. Uh, if you drive down from where I live in Sacramento, which is Northern California to LA, right in the central California area, they have, they raise cows and it smells so bad. And you see these cows and they're stacked up together and laying in mud. And it's not, that's not the way animals were supposed to be raised. They're not grazed. They're not eating the food that they're supposed to eat. In fact, what came to my mind was uh, mad cow disease. And I can understand why the cows are mad because they have started feeding in their feed when they had that uh, mad cow's disease came out, they found out that some of the farmers were grinding up the sick cows and mixing it into the feed of the healthy cows, which they're already not eating properly anyway because they're not being grazed. But on top of not being grazed properly, they were mixing in their feed, the, the bodies of dead sick cows. So I'd be mad too. <laughs> so, so I see a hand raised face. No, that's my hand. Um, so that's the, that's the society we're living in right now where the food is not even safe to eat because you don't, unless you raise it yourself or unless you have a, a relationship with the farmers or, or there's a farmer's market where you can purchase food, you know, you know it's straight from the farm, then you don't know what you're eating. You don't know if it's you know, pesticide free, you don't know if it's herbicide free. So it, we have to be very conscientious about um, our diet, where it's coming from. So I see a hand, uh, Toyin. Toyin has his hand up. You're muted, Dr. O. So, yeah, so I'm going to lower my hands, you know. Okay. I didn't mean to raise it. Good evening. Not now, anyway. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Let's keep going. Yes. So that was the main issue is the fast food. That if you're eating animal products, they're full of hormones because they, the, the same thing they do with chickens, they do with cows. They give them food with hormones and they give them grains, which cows are not just like other animals, cows are not supposed to eat grain. They're supposed to eat grass because they have, they're ruminants. Ruminants have two stomachs. So they chew the grass, it goes down into their stomach, it comes back up and it, then it goes down into their second stomach to completely digest their body is made for eating grass. But that, you know, I, I don't know if anybody's seen which, that chicken commercial, um, Foster Farms, one of them that say that they feed their chickens vegetarian diet. They're not saying they allow the chickens to be free range and that they, and chickens aren't supposed to just eat a, just a, a grain vegetarian diet. They eat bugs and worms and you know whatever they can get out in the field, but they're not giving them that. They're controlling their diet, but they advertise it as if that's something good, which is not necessarily something good. So the effects of this Western diet is we have high incidences of, especially those who eat a lot of the meat that's not pastured that we have a high incidence of um, gout, kidney problems, liver problems, um, because when you eat a high protein, and the thing is because of that, our, our, our diet, Western diet is protein centric, which means the steak is the center of the plate. And then we add potatoes. <laughs> And maybe add a few vegetables to go with it. But the, the protein, the meat, is the center of the plate. So it's what, what are we going to have with our steak? Or what are we going to have with our fish? And that was surprising to me when I went to Ghana is I ordered 
some grilled fish. That's the only time I eat fish is when I go to Ghana. Uh, and all I got was fish. There was, you know, more like an escovish with a few peppers on top. When I ordered a salad, they charged me more money to have a salad. So I just want a salad. That'll be, it was more than the fish. They don't really like here, like you have a, a meal, it's a uh, protein and vegetables, and then maybe a salad that goes with that meal. I was surprised by that because most of the places that I went, um, the fish was the center of the plate. And then you, if you, you have to ask for vegetables and you have to ask for a salad. So that was surprising to me. So the problem with having a protein centric diet is it's high in uric acid. Uric acid is what gives us gout, kidney stones, uh, some of the issues with our bones because now our, our systems are acidic. And because our systems are acidic and, and our body tries to buffer the acid in our body and our system, it creates, it leaches the calcium from our bones. So in order to buffer the acid in our system. So then as we get older, then our bones become more fragile because we've leached the calcium because our body's job is to survive. Now you can, you can survive if, with broken bones, but you can't survive if your kidney shut down, if your liver shuts down, if those things start to shut down. And also uh, gallstones. I haven't heard of more people with gallstones recently than in a long time. My parents, oh, uh, I have gallstones. She was, I mean, she's, I would say 40-ish. Why are you 40 years old with gallstones? Because she eats a high meat diet. She's from, she's from Eastern Europe. She's from Mondovia, which is near Ukraine. They eat a high meat diet. So now she's trying to figure out, well, I've been trying to invite her to our, our, uh, our lifestyle class. <laughs> I did invite her to our lifestyle class so that she could learn a little bit more about diet. And I've been talking about herbs and things she can do for the gallbladder and cleanse the gallbladder. But that's the issue with having a, a protein-centric diet and meat and potatoes, a meat and potatoes diet, a meat and potatoes and white bread diet. So you have a hamburger, then you put it on a white bun, then you put some uh, ketchup with, with a, uh, sugar in it on top of that. Then you have some French fries that are cooked in the same oil that they cooked the first set of French fries that morning. And the problem with that is the oil, you're not supposed to use fat more than once. So once you use fat, and we, I was gonna talk about that anyway on our health matters, when we talk about fats and oils, you're not supposed to use fats more than once. So once you use it, you toss it. And they don't do that when you go to these fast food restaurants. Well, even the uh, more uh, high-end restaurants, they cook the, the French fries. If they have regular fries or potato fries, they cook it in the same oil over and over again. And what started out as a monosaturated fat, they may be using some flour oil or some good fat, but by the time you <clears throat> eat it all day and you cook those potatoes in it all day, then now it's a trans fat. So that's clogging up the arteries of our people is eating French fries from the fast food restaurants or even from home if you keep using that. Now I know, I don't know if anyone here was raised with that big can of Crisco, <laughs> the Crisco can on the stove. <laughs> we had the Crisco can on the stove. You cook the bacon in the morning and you pour the fat in the Crisco can. You take that same fat, you put it in an iron skillet and use it to fry your chicken. And then you pour that same oil back in the, the Crisco can. So we were using that same fat over and over and over again. I'm, I'm shocked that I don't have atherosclerosis after eating all that trans fat over all those years. But I'm, I'm blessed that I, in time, found out that a different way of, of eating and a different way of um, handling my diet. 
I don't know. Did any, has any did anyone else have that experience growing up? Did you keep using the same fat as you were growing up? Um, it's not just growing up. I was surprised you said that because we still do that. You put we the fat back in the can. <laughs> yes, put it back in the can or you know in the in the frying pan, cover it and put it away to use it for the next time. Mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, not a good habit because now once you keep heating it, it used to be. Uh, I won't. I don't want to get too much into the chemistry of it, but fat has the components of water molecules, and once you heat it, those components of water molecules come off, and you get trans fats. the The hydrogens that are still attached to the fat have double bonds, which are not easy to break because you've heated the oil over and over again. So whenever I cook something in fat, I toss it. I don't use it again. And that's, that's, that's a, a dual blessing because you don't get as much fat. <laughs> You're not going to fry as many as much food, less fried food. And so, and, and not clog, no clogged arteries. So I'm talking about the so-called good fats, you know, like sunflower oil, uh, safflower oil. Well, you're not supposed to cook with olive oil anyway, but the good fats, that's what happens when you reuse them, is that you change that nice, that good fat, monosaturated or polyunsaturated to trans. So throw that, take, go get that skillet and throw that. <laughs> <laughs> down the sink with some hot water and, and detergent. <laughs> okay, Dr. G, so yes. you're not supposed to cook with olive oil? No. Just, it's a table oil? Um, vegetable oil yeah. and not all vegetable oils because not no, all vegetable just, oils are created equal. So she said olive, olive oil. Yeah, olive oil you don't cook with. Olive oil should only be used to finish your food. Like if you're having a salad or you roast vegetables and coconut oil and you still need more fat, then you put the olive oil on top. Not, not cook with it. It's, it's monosaturated and it changes the structure and it's, uh, olive oil has certain vitamins in it and heating that changes the whole structure of the olive oil. So you're not supposed to heat olive oil. Boy, we're going to need a roadmap. <laughs> That's what we're getting here. <laughs> and if you have canola oil in your refrigerator, your cabinet, take it to the nearest dump trash can and dump it. What of sunflower oil? <laughs> as long as it's, if it says on it that it's expeller pressed or cold pressed, then that fat is okay. So, Expeller uh, pressed or cold pressed. So what about um, corn oil? Because I've been using olive oil to saute my cauliflower. So I'm doing it really wrong now. Well, corn oil is a, is a big no too. Let's talk about oils that you can use as such okay. as to cook would be avocado oil oh, because okay. it has a very high flash point. And you can heat it up very high without changing the structure. Okay. Um, and co coconut oil is okay to cook with. And I'm then you sorry. then you can rub a little bit on your face and moisturize your skin. <laughs> uh, uh, Doctor okay, Gila. Doctor G. Uh, okay. Go ahead, Doctor Veronica. Go ahead. Okay. The sunflower oil says is expel expeller pressed sodium yes. free vegan and it says it's good for grilling cooking and frying yes it's that's okay it is but i'm just saying a uh, uh, oil that is even has an even higher flash point is avocado oil I, I, I avocado oil is, too yeah so uh -huh. safflower oil is okay sunflower oil is okay as long as it's cold or expeller pressed okay yeah it says that's right and it's, it says organic Saute, fry, and it's 450 degree Fahrenheit smoke point. Right. And that's, you want the one with the highest smoke point when you're cooking, yeah. like, um, on, like, I use an iron skillet, 
for everything. So guess when you're cooking in your iron skillet or grilling your vegetables in the oven, then you want an oil that has a high smoke point. So I guess right, I'm going to have to apologize to, my, to apologize to my daughter because she told me to use avocado oil. And I said, no, I'm using olive yeah. oil. Okay, thank well, you. We were, but we were told that growing up to use olive oil, that if you want a heart healthy oil to use olive oil, Right. But olive oil, it has a first of all has a low smoke point, very low smoke point, and there are other components like vitamin E. Your vitamins are heat sensitive, mm. so you don't want to heat it up. That's going to kill the vitamins that are in the oils, because you won't get the the best benefit from them if you're killing off the vitamins. Oh, all right. Okay. Thank you so question. much, uh, Doctor G. Because you know. All of these things, they come and go. I'm mm -hmm. very apprehensive about using this air fryer because it's just heat on top of your food and that heat is not organic. So I'm trying to fry my fries mm -hmm. with uh, uh, oil, mm -hmm. but uh, you know, I'm, I'm not one to use oil sparingly. I come from my bill that we use oil a lot, so. Me too, but I used to have a I still do. I it's just so I could have a throwback just to look yeah. at it. Even though I never, I don't use it anymore. It's like a, it's it's a deep uh, pan, um, like a um, a pot, but it's narrow, yeah. and you fill it up with oil, and you yep. you fry your stuff in it. Yep. But I stopped using it because I don't. I don't want. It's not that I don't like fries. It's just that I don't want to have to throw the oil out every time I use it. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I'm frugal. People may have another word for it, but I call it frugal. <laughs> yeah, it's called cheap. That's right. Yeah, I like <laughs> I like frugal better. <laughs> yeah, frugal. But my question is, the oil that, you know, because now they come up with spray. Spray, the, the avocado, they have it in a spray. It's a... I don't know how to describe it. It's in a, a small, skinny uh, yeah, can. Yeah, I've, I've seen those. Yeah, it's okay. a spray. Yeah, and it, that has it comes in different oils actually. Yeah. Uh, okay. That is, is that is that healthy or should I just get the real oil and try to be the, uh, the, the real oil? You can you can buy those little containers that are pressurized. You can put the real oil in the pressurized container and spray it on your food. If you look at the back of some of those oils that are spray on oils that they say they're like coconut oil or some other kind of oil. And you look on the back, there are usually other ingredients that are in there besides the propellant that's not good for you, that you shouldn't be breathing. They have to put something in there to pressurize the oil to get it to come out of the can. That's or, my point. Exactly. Yeah. So okay. you don't want the propellants. All you want is the oil. And sometimes they put other stuff in the oil to preserve it. And you don't want that either. So it's the best just to buy the oil. Get you one of those pumps that pressurizes it. And then you all you have is the oil, pressurized oil. And you can just spray that on your vegetables and stick it in the oven. Um, Sister Faith just said that not all avocado oil are 100% avocado. So right. always look at the ingredients and see what it says. Yes. In the US, people are mandated to say exactly what's in there, hopefully. Well, and some most things. We're going to talk about things. that too when we start talking about <laughs> ingredients and reading yeah. labels. I think you should, go ahead. <laughs> you should go ahead and let's defer questions to a little bit later so you can give us the crust of uh, what you have for us tonight. Okay, so fats and oils okay so we, we kind of covered that we'll cover that a little bit more in our health matters uh session um yeah toss out toss the oil after you use it once canola oil canola oil is not a real oil it's a gmo back in the i think it was in the 80s the United States gave Canada permission to change safflower oil. It's, it's from safflowers that have been genetically modified. And then 
they changed the name from safflower to canola. So there's no really such thing as a canola flower. Is safflower genetically modified safflowers, and the U.S. gave Canada permission to to export it to the United States. So if you're using canola oil, that's the other one that can be um, on the way to the trash to take the other stuff, the oil that's been sitting on the stove for a month <laughs> after being used four or five times. You can take the canola oil there too. So there's no such thing as canola. There's a man-made plant. And those are some of the things that as we're talking about the Western diet and the prevalence of the Western diet all over the world, every place I've been, Philippines, they have fast food. And like I said, it's also permeated our kitchens. So that's why we have a higher incidence of um, gout from the uric acid. You have a higher incidence of atherosclerosis from the wrong types of fat not health, heart healthy fat. For me, the, the acid test to tell whether oil is good or not is if you take some on your finger, it may be a solid at room temperature, but if you take it on your finger and you rub it on your skin and it kind of dissolves and melts in your skin, then usually that's okay. Like, you know, coconut oil is solid at room temperature in the winter, but if you take a finger full and just rub it on your skin, it just melts right into your skin. So that's my test to see if it's good. If you take some um, hydrogenated palm oil, because palm oil is okay, as long as it's cold pressed <laughs> and it's not hydrogenated, not, it's not refined, because they refine palm oil and they use palm oil in a lot of things and they call it something different when they refine it and use it in other things. You could also get coconut oil that has been refined. That's, that's the one that, you take some on the, your finger and rub it in on your skin, it does not melt. It just sits on your hand, just like Crisco sits on your hand because it's been, it's been hydrogenated or partially hydrogenated. So that's my acid test to tell if it's something I can put in my mouth, if it melts on my skin at my skin temperature, then it's really okay. So any more questions about fats and oils? Yes, um, Sister, Sister Karen, um, was asking about grapeseed oil. And Dr. Jagwe had posted that grapeseed oil is also safe for cooking and frying. He also said that the propellants and oil stabilizers are not healthy. Right. But Mr. Karen followed with asking if you can comment on grapeseed grape oil. Grapeseed oil. Um, I guess I'm kind of like a, a, an oil uh, snob because I only, use, I only use certain oils to cook with and certain oils to put, because I, I like today to put the same oil in my pot that I could put on my skin. So grapeseed oil is okay, as long as it follows the same criteria, expel or pressed and um, not, not processed in any way, expel or pressed and, or cold pressed. Okay, so um, Dr. Fawale said that this is great information. She has been using corn or vegetable oil. What's your comment on that? Corn oil to me is a no because, and we, we're going to talk about corn <laughs> when we talk about organic versus conventional. Most corn, is stored in silos because I've, I've never i don't know if, if anyone else has seen organic corn oil but i've never seen organic corn oil um usually if it's organic corn is people buy it just to roast and eat but corn oil is highly processed corn is stored in big silos and it usually gets very moldy because it's stored in silos sometime for months but they, by the time they process it, we don't see that part of it. So corn oil is not really a heart healthy oil and vegetable oil is suspect because you don't know what kind of vegetables they're using in it. That's a very um, 
nebulous term vegetable oils. Well, what kind of vegetables are you using? Is it whatever is left over from making something else or what is it? Um, soybean oil, I put in the same category as corn oil. It's not necessarily a heart healthy. You want something that's heart healthy. So both of those, go ahead and spend a couple extra dollars and buy some avocado oil or some corn, coconut oil. Those, those are the two major ones that I use is avocado and coconut oil. And I have used palm oil, but hot palm oil is a little more expensive. So just to support what you said about the corn, um, I'm reading here that corn is the most commonly grown crop in the US and most of it is GMO. Yes. Most GMO corn is created to resist insects, pests, or tolerate herbicides. Mm -hmm. I've read it somewhere, so I went to you know quickly check it. That corn is one of the most um, uh, you know affected when we're talking about foods that have been compromised, right? So to say, and they are claiming that these things are toxic to insect pests and stuff like that, but not to humans pests livestock or other animals. But they don't know because there hasn't been a long enough period of time. And I don't know, I haven't seen any studies where they really tested to see what the effects of long-term, except we know that it's moldy and we know that most corn is, is GMO as well as soybeans, most of it, because really uh, soybeans were grown to feed cattle which they're not supposed to eat, but they, were, they raised soybeans to feed cattle. It, just, it was just in the last, I'd say 20, 30 years that they've started creating more products in the United States. Now in, in Asian countries, they've always used soy. They've always made like tofu and other soy products. But here in the United States, they stopped just raising, they found out, you know, this is a cash crop, not just for feeding our animals, but also because people are now becoming more aware of soy products like tofu and soy milk and all that kind of stuff that we're going to raise soy. Now, even though it's already been GMO, you can't un-GMO a plant wasn't <laughs> genetically modified. Um, is that a word un-GMO? Well, I just created a new word. Un-GMO a plant <laughs> while <laughs> once it's been genetically modified to make it fit for consumption. So now you can buy organic soybeans. You can buy organic corn, but usually the organic because it's so expensive to, to grow, they don't usually use it to make like corn oil and they don't usually use like to make soybean oil because you don't really see any uh, organic corn oil or soy, soybean oil is usually, usually more used more commercially for pr creating products because you see soy oil in a lot of stuff, a lot of um, packaged products. If I see soy oil, I put it back on the, on the shelf. So Dr. Jagbe is asking about MCT oil. And mm -hmm. Antitawa wants to know what MCT oil is. It's medium chain triglyceride oil. Yes. And you will see that in, I've seen it in coconut oil, that you have the MCT coconut oil, medium chain triglyceride. So it's been, it has been processed to remove well, certain things and then you have the medium chain. Go ahead. Well, and it's naturally occurring in coconut oil. That's why I don't buy MCT oil. I said, well, I, I use coconut oil. Why would I need to buy a separate oil or triglyceride when MCT is naturally occurring in coconut oil? So you don't really need extra oil or the extra triglyceride if, if you're using coconut oil already. Thank I you. Just, I just take a tablespoon of coconut oil. Thank you. So uh, Dr. Ajay is asking, what about Nativa organic red palm oil? Oh, I use that. 
What is Nativa? I, is it a brand or what? Yeah, na, 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 Navita or is it Nativa? Yeah, Nativa is a brand. Yeah. And I have someone in my kitchen, on my kitchen shelf right now. Because I, I use it to cook and I also use it to put on my skin. Because it's very high in vitamin A. Because it's red, red vitamin A. But, you know, people say palm oil is rich in, um, in fatty... Fatty acids, yeah. In, no, it's rich in fatty. No, is it fatty acids? It's it's, uh, it, it's polysaturated fat. Oh, saturated fat. Well, no, so is coconut poly, oil. Polysaturated <laughs> fat in in palm oil, and so it's not good oil. Um, Papa Doctor Michael Ye was the one who first told me that. Oh no 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 no, that palm oil is actually good for for our consumption. Yes. What we have read is that it's a, it has a polysaturated fat and we should stay away from it. Yeah. Well, those are probably people that own uh, Crisco. <laughs> they, own, they own Crisco oil. <laughs> so they want you to use, they want you to use this other stuff, but it's, it, it passes the test. If you take some, the red palm oil and you rub it on your skin, it just dissolves right into your skin. It doesn't just sit on top of the skin. It is uh, liquid at body temperature. So that means if you and ingest it's something it, good from Africa. Yes, yes. And the and the reason when I went to Africa, when I went to Ghana, I was looking for there's this oil that they have on the shelf, some kind of vegetable oil. You see all kinds of ads for this particular vest, liquid vegetable oil. This is a European country that is importing this liquid vegetable oil into Africa. And when I talked, you know, when I was doing all my interviews, when we were doing the, the health screenings, everybody, that's all they used. I said, well, you have coconut oil, you have palm oil, why are you using, well, that's all we know. Is this particular oil that they import into Ghana from someplace else, which is, not good for you. So it's like the, the mindset has been twisted to reject those things that are African and that are good for us and embrace the European stuff, which is not good for us because somebody had a, an ad, a commercial that said that this is, you know, use this. But palm oil is good for you. Like I said, it passes the test. You rub it on your skin, it just dissolves right in. Dr. O, I apologize. I'm driving, so I'm not able to type. But can you ask Dr. Ajagbe, what about the, uh, I don't know what they call it in English, the oil from uh, Idiagmo oil. I don't, what is it called? Um, I know, Idiagmo oil. Okay. Yeah, yeah, what is it called in English? Yeah. I'm yeah. Canel. I'm Canel oil. Yeah, that's what we're just yes. talking about. Palm palm canel. Oil. No, but palm no, canel no, is the canel, palm oil. The canel is the inside. It is, yeah. mm. The canel is the inside of the... Uh, right, the seed. Oh. The, the seed, seed. The seed of the palm. Yes. The palm nuts. The palm nuts. Yes. Palm nuts. Yes. Yeah, this, the seed within the palm nut is right. the palm canel. So mm -hmm. okay. that also is very rich in oil. Yes. Good fact. Thank you. Wow. Dr. O, you're, you're muted. I'm sorry. I'm muted. I was talking. That is good oil. Yes. Yeah. Good, good, good fat. So, we, so need, we need good fat. Why? Because our brain is mostly fat. <laughs> so when somebody calls you a fathead, say, thank you. I've <laughs> been eating my good fat, so my brain is going to work better. <laughs> So um, I have some questions here. Oh, is it comment? What are these terms used for oil for? Vegan, non-hydrogenated, virgin, extra virgin. Okay, so non-hydrogenated means they haven't reduced. Remember I talked about there's water molecules attached to the, the oil uh, molecule that breaks away when you heat it. 
So unhydrogenated means that they haven't heated that oil to process it. Um, virgin, when it comes to like coconut oil, there's no such thing as extra virgin coconut oil. There's, there's virgin, which means they haven't heated it up or processed it, but extra virgin is just a way to get you to spend more money. Virgin is fine. If they cold press the coconut oil, it's fine. So the extra virgin and virgin are basically the same thing. That, that's just a money-making thing. Oh, it's extra virgin coconut oil. There's no such thing as extra virgin coconut oil. It's all this virgin and extra virgin is basically the same process. But you, it, costs, it costs you more money to buy extra virgin. <laughs> so and what was the other one? Hydrogenated? Hydrogenated, yeah. So hydrogenated is where they use a heat process to pull off those water molecules so that it's hard at room temperature. That's why like Crisco is hard at room temperature and it doesn't just melt easily. You have to heat it up really hot to get it to melt. Yeah, Sister Fitch is saying this are marketing strategy and Dr. Mm -hmm. Jose reminds us that margarine is hydrogenated oil. Right, margarines are hydrogenated. So um, Dr. Jagu also wants to know, does the phytoestrogen in the soy influence the growth of animals raised for human consumption? Um, so which animals do they feed the... Phytoestrogen to? I don't know. Oh, you mean, oh, the, you he talking about the soy, because soy, yeah. soy is high in phytoestrogen. Yeah. Yes, um, because they need them to get fat fast. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they look mature even though they're not. And that's the same thing with our kids. When the kids drink the the milk that's come from the cows that they fed soy, then they mature faster. That's why a nine month old, a three year, looks like they're three. And why women, girls, they're nine or 10 years old and they're already getting breast because of the, the estrogens that are in the food that they're eating. So they're maturing much faster to starting their cycles much earlier than we did. You know, because we thought, okay, 13 to 14 is around the age that we would norm women would normally start their cycles. But now you have girls nine years old or younger starting their menstrual cycles. And it's because of the hormones in the chicken, hormones in the meat, and hormones in the other foods that they're getting that's causing them to mature faster and their ovaries maturing faster than they normally would. Well, we just heard about a 10 year old who was raped and got pregnant. It was all over the news and um, it's reality of life, exactly what you're talking about. Um, you wonder why this topic is important. It's very important because we're seeing an upsurge of cancer and mm -hmm. um, going back to research, New research is showing that Western diet is directly linked to cancer. Not only that, Western diet is linked to obesity. Obesity is linked to diabetes. And diabetes is not linked to cancer. Mm -hmm. Guess what? Western diet, new research has shown also um, causes colon cancer. Remember, we've talked about this. I think we talked about it even last week mm -hmm. that now screening for colon cancer has been um, changed from starting at age 50 to 45 because we've seen it early. And the colon cancer is coming because of the food that we eat is causing us, our digestive system to slow down. But if we're eating they, uh, and we're gonna talk about digesting some in our other class. If we're eating food and especially meat because meat has a transit time of seven hours and especially meat that has not been grass fed or grass raised, seven hours. That means that meat is sitting inside the colon putrefying for seven hours and it causes constipation. 
constipation is why we have a higher incidence of colon cancer because I've talked I talked to people you know when we're doing our screening and I've talked to other people that they don't go to the bathroom but every two or three days you're supposed to go to the bathroom after you eat you're supposed to have a bowel movement after you eat so if you're not having a bowel movement after you eat then you're behind so many bowel movements if you're not having one every time you eat. So that's why we're having a higher incidence of colon cancer because the food is sitting in our colon putrefying and is not being pushed out the way it's supposed to be pushed out by being stimulated by our next meal. So your next meal is supposed to stimulate your body to, to and because of our lifestyles too, because most of us work and we don't want to have to go to the bathroom in the middle of the day in a strange place. So we'll wait <laughs> or yeah, most of them will just wait. I'll wait till I get home. That means all this stuff is, is sitting in the colon and it seeps out of the colon because our colon is porous. It seeps yeah. out of the colon and it goes into the other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're also connected with the digestion in the colon we also see more women with fibroids, more women with uh, uterine cancer, more women with other diseases of the, of the re um, reproductive system because this poison is sitting in your, your colon and it seeps through the colon into other parts of the body. And it causes what we call prolapses of the colon, which means your colon, instead of being straight across the transverse colon, now becomes a U-shape and is sitting in mashing the uterus and that poison is gets into the uterus and now you're having other issues besides just problems with the digestion and the colon. So uh, doctor, a uh, question. Go ahead, sir. So, so you um, mentioned this colon cancer problem. Uh, some of the research that I read um, stated that uh, a lot of people, especially people that have you know, a lot of weight or carrying a big tumor, have te sometimes 10 to 20 pounds of fecal matter in their colon they're carrying yes. around. Yes. And, and that's part of the reasons we have high incidence of colon cancer in this, especially in the US. Yes. I'm going to mm. tell you a story. Mm. When I uh, I live in Sacramento now, but before I moved to Sacramento, I lived in the Bay Area. And I was doing nutritional consulting where I would come to the house and I would talk about whatever, you know, questions you had about diet, health, herbs or whatever. And there was a 31 year old man that uh, I was doing some consultations with and I, he started taking a colon cleanse. And uh, about maybe two weeks after he started cleaning his colon, he said he had a bowel movement and there was an orange pill in his feces that he hadn't, he was 30, that he hadn't taken since he was 10. It had gotten into the folds of his colon and was never, and never got out. He was mm -hmm. 10 the last time he had taken, it was tetracycline that he was on because of acne and he had not taken that, that tablet and since he was 10 years old. That's how much waste had been tucked away in the folds of his colon, 20 years. Wow. So um, to buttress what you said, sir, Dr. Jagwe says constipation is directly linked to colon cancer. And I'm oh, yeah. sure he uh, confirmed that before he said that. Like I said, more researches need to be done, but Western diet has been directly linked to colon cancer. Um, Dr. Akintode says, she, he asked, could we stay away or should we stay away from fried foods altogether? or just minimal consumption? What about French fries that's not oily? Well, if you do them in your air fryer, 
I think it was <laughs> Madame Laura said she didn't she didn't she doesn't trust the air fryer. <laughs> but if you just do them in the air fryer or just brush them with a little avocado oil and do them in the oven, that's a big there's a big difference between eating them that way and deep fried. When you get them from the restaurants, they're deep fried and that oil and who knows how often they change the oil trap or change out the oil in the kitchens. Sometimes it's not every day. But even if it is every day, if you're the last person to get an order of fries for the day, that's the same oil that was there that morning. And they've cooked like who, how many hundreds of French fries from that morning to that last order of the day before they clean the oil. It's already hydrogenated, trans fat, which clogs our arteries. Okay, so Dr. Jagbet now brought up the issue of uh, high fructose corn syrup. I thought it wouldn't come up. He says the primary cause of high fructose, the primary cause of diabetes, diabetes. I think is what he's talking about obesity is sir can you speak and talk about the probiotics and corn syrup yourself high fructose corn syrup yourself um i don't understand how that is phrased in there well i apologize i think sometimes when you try to type some of these things don't come out right uh what i'm trying to say is that everything that uh you alluded to as regards the progression of disease uh, entities uh, from uh, obesity to, you know, diabetes, and then connecting it to cancer. I'm saying that the primary cause of all of that is the, uh, the introduction of the high fructose corn syrup into the food chain of, in America. Uh, and that is, this is where it started from. And there, there has been a direct correlation between uh, high fructose corn syrup introduction into the American mainstream diet uh, with uh, obesity. And so, and those are the, the people that really consume the high fructose corn syrup the most are the low income, uh, you know, uh, section of the population because the foods, the fast food that they are addicted to, uh, almost all contain the uh, high it fructose corn syrup. Mm -hmm. So with that as the source of the addiction that they, 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 they become hooked on donuts, they become hooked on cakes, they become hooked on uh, uh, sandwiches, they become hooked on almost everything that is baked has high fructose corn syrup instead of sugar, instead of cane sugar. Uh, now some bakeries, knowing that it's hitting their bottom line, uh, now adding to their packages that no high fructose corn syrup, because they now know, I mean, to be politically correct, they now try to identify with the fact that they are health, con health conscious. So uh, we need to remember that anytime you are buying all these big, big goods, check and see if it has high fructose corn syrup. If it does, my suggestion and recommendation is avoid anything that contains high fructose corn syrup. Well, they've banned it here in California. So a lot of the fruit juices that used to have HFCs, they'll say on the package, no HFCs. But the problem is that the, and we'll talk about it when we talk about sugars and sweeteners in a couple of weeks. The, they have other hidden sugars in other forms. Yeah. Hidden, and they call it something else. But it's no, they just call it sugar. They just call it sugar. They don't want to extract, they don't want to expand it anymore. They just well, say it's sugar. The sugar, or mm -hmm. they'll say, and they think that cane sugar is better than any other sugar. But if it's white and it's been uh, uh, adulterated, it's just as bad. Mm -hmm. bleached yeah it's just as bad is they they keep the good stuff or sell you the good stuff separately in in um that the stuff molasses and, and, and you, raw sugar in the raw or sugar in the raw and then they give you the leftovers just like they do with the white rice they take all the good brown stuff off and then give you the leftovers in the form of white rice 
So it's 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 a, a money thing, and it's a thing is they don't really care about our health. Yes, it's about care like, like you said, health. bottom line. Yes. But you know, if you re really read read the labels, you're gonna see sugar disguised as a lot of, and we'll do that in a couple of weeks. Disguised yes. as a lot of different things. Uh, right. What do they call it? Malto, malt dextrose, malto something. Yeah, yes. they put. What I try to tell people is that any sugar that we are eating that cannot be burned in the system to release energy right. becomes a big problem long term. Yeah, because it so, fools the body and, into thinking that it's going to get energy and it gets nothing. So, right. so now it, that turns into fat. Yes, that's the reason why any sugar that is not glucose, that, that will not give rise to glucose as a fine uh, product that can be absorbed by the cells is not good for any human consumption. Yeah, and that, that artificial stuff is worse. Yes. Yeah, but, but the thing is, what you just said, I hear you. But see, you're talking to us. How do you know the sugar that will not get converted into glucose? Let's speak English, bottom line. No high fructose corn syrup. Right. If we see it in anything, let's stay away from it. And maltodextrin. It's, maltodextrin is another one. Yes. When you see it, stay away from it. Sugar is camouflaged by in different by being named different things. But you mm -hmm. know what? Um, I want people of, people of Google Doctor, but Google is also great at you know some things. Um, Things like that. You see the ingredients on something, you're not sure what it is, Google it and see what it says. Right. Um, so much that is hidden in food, we have to be careful. Uh, there's, we in medicine are seeing too much cancer and it's not just here in, in the US, it's all over. It's mm -hmm. staggering. And people are just dying of cancer. We can prevent it. Please, if you missed the episode last week with uh, Dr. Mike Oye, go to YouTube Medical Mondays with Dr. O and watch it. It's important. And you know, before we round up tonight, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Mike to comment on the email I sent out. If I didn't get, if I don't have your email, private chat me or put it in the box so I can include you. But I did send out the notes that I took last week. It was the first time I've ever done that because I don't take notes in the, in the chat box. But for some reason, as I started speaking, I started taking notes and I wrote them, but I sent them so that he can look at them and see if I wrote anything in error so that I can correct it. And I'll give him the chance to do that in a few minutes, in a while. So, uh, Dr. O. Yes, sir. You asked about the probiotics too. So yes, you want me to say something about that or no? Yes, sir. Please, sir. Well, yeah, the probiotics are necessary to be included in our regular diet if we can. Uh, we should make effort to do that because that is the best colon cleanser that anybody could ingest naturally. If we are able to do that, because most of the vegetables that we ingest already uh, contain the prebiotic fibers. Mm -hmm. And the prebiotic fibers will be digested by the probiotic, including all the residues of that stay long in the colon. And that is the reason why it's easy to pass out uh, the uh, waste when you have uh, probiotics included in your diet. Now you can get probiotic from uh, yogurt, uh, there are specific yogurts that are now made. I don't trust the Activa because uh, I think there was a study that actually tried to uh, confirm the, the, uh, the population of the probiotics that is used in Activa, even though they marketed it big as though it is the most affordable source of probiotics. Uh, the, this research seemed to, you know, uh, negate that. But I think if you are a member of uh, Costco, there is uh, uh, a, a brand in Costco that actually is, is one of the best yogurts you can get. 
Uh, I'm, I don't have any uh, business connection to Costco, but at least what, ha what has been working for me, I can share with uh, our guests and uh, you know, participants so that you can at least look for something similar. If you don't find the same brand, look for any other source of uh, you know, probiotics to add to your meal. So what I've been using, because I don't do any dairy, mm -hmm. is foragers. Foragers is made with cashew milk. And it's a, it's a very good, they have a, a, a yogurt that's made with cashew milk. And they also have a kefir, a liquid probiotic that doesn't have any dairy. Also, um, beet kvass. That's a, okay. uh, beet kvass is a cultured beet. And you just, you add salt and you add, uh, you can add a little bit of, like some people use kombucha to culture, but if you don't yes. do anything to it. I was going to say kombucha as well as kimchi. Yes. Yes. Kimchi so make, is also a sauerkraut. Yeah, sauerkraut is fine. Yeah, so those Homemade are very pickles. Good sources. Yes. <laughs> Homemade pickles. <laughs> But anything that, you know, if for those who are leaning away from dairy, then the foragers or the beet kvass is cheap. You can do it on top of your refrigerator. It just takes two or three beets and you add, you know, it cultures and over a couple of days. So, and come, of course, kombucha. I make my kombucha. Dr. O, you're, you're, you're you take two or three beets and do what with it? You put it in a jar. Mm -hmm. You add a, a, I use Himalayan sea salt. You put a, a tablespoon of Himalayan sea salt. Now this is a two quart jar. I, use, I usually do a two quart jar. You put it in the jar, you add water and you, you add um, whey. The whey is when you, when you have yogurt, the liquid stuff that separates from the solid is called whey. So you put whey in it and the way it cultures the beets and it has kind of like a, a tart, sweet, because beets are sweet, but it is good for diabetics because you you get the beets and the, and the, uh, the B vitamins and all the, the good things about beets without the sugar because it di the sugar is digested with, when it cultures. So I recommend it for people that have diabetes so they're not getting the sugar with the beet, because you know, beets are very high in sugar. So they're, they're getting the culture and they're getting the probiotics without the beet. I'll send out the recipe. <laughs> I'll put the recipe Thank on. you. Can, can, you, can, you please, yes. can you please do that? Because you know, yeah, uh, Sister Tinu was actually asking about that. And it should be good for people with anemia also. Oh yeah, yeah, the beets. <laughs> the beets, yes. Yes, high in iron, mm -hmm. all the good things about beets. Exactly. So um, I love this question. Dr. Ajay wants to know, what is the most environmental friendly way to dispose cooking oil? You mentioned that. How do you dispose it? You know, because I've been told, don't throw it in your sink. Right. It I know. Plug it. Right. I was, I know. But I just mix, I use, <laughs> I use like dishwashing liquid to emulsify it first. That's it. Dishwashing liquid to yeah. do what? Yes. It emulsifies the oils before you put them in the sink. Yeah. So it's an emulsifier. Any soap, any soap would do that. Yes. So you pour soap in the oil yes. and then yes. you put it in the sink. I would add, look, my sink has been clogged once before and they said it was oil. I'll put it in plastic bag after doing that then and then throw it out in the trash, no? No, 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 no. It, it's like you're doing dishes. You don't throw your dishes away because it has oil. Uh -uh. You will dissolve this oil with soap. It's called my cell, my cell develop, the, uh, development. So it yes. will form yeah. my cell. The, so the oil will disperse. The, the oil will become totally unrecognized. It will right. not stick to anything anymore once you put soap in it. Soap and water will completely eliminate the oil for you. Yeah, so that's what they call the wastewater plant. I used to work for the wastewater treatment plant in Colorado, and that's what they would do. They would first charge the Lay's potato chips for sending their oil samples to the lab. <laughs> and then they would charge them for disposing of it because they had digesters. 
and they would put an emulsifier in the digester, that huge digester is about you know, the size of my yard or bigger. And they would put the oil, put the digesting uh, solution in the, the fat and would break down the fat. And even soil lecithin, soil lecithin is one of the best uh, emulsifiers. It's good to take too. <laughs> you take. What is it? Uh, so I I use the sunflower lecithin, but yeah. lecithin is very good for your body. Yeah, it, lecithin is good. Is it is one of the best emulsifiers? They use it in uh, chocolate factory. Uh, when they use okay. the oil. So, and- Dr. Jagwe, we're going to keep it real. We're going to put soap in the oil. We've been mm-hmm. told once we, once we use oil once to mm-hmm. cook, to fry, to do what have you, we should not, re- we should not reuse it. So we'll dump soap in it. Yes. yes so, and water. then water, and it should water. be, Dr. Jagwe, hold it, please, sir. Then it should be okay now to dump in this sink and yes, it will not come with this hot sink. water. Yeah. Okay. yeah, you use hot water. Thank you. you hot, hot water. water. And, okay. Yes, it will be done. Fantastic. Thank you. So, what about stevia, Dr. Lo- and Sister yeah, I saw Lola? that. I saw that. You saw that. What yes. about stevia? Okay. Stevia is a plant. The, the plant is green. <laughs> but by the time you get the stevia powder, it's white. So how did it get from green to white? They had to do some kind of process to it to, process, to get it, extract the sweetness from it to get it white. So if you want to use stevia, you could buy a stevia plant, which I plan to do this coming Thursday when I take my friend to the co-op, is buy a stevia plant. Then you can use a, just a little piece of the leaf to put in your tea and it will sweeten your tea. It's naturally sweet. But I used to use stevia, the extract and all that, but I stopped using it because I just, it's, it's, it's uh, not a really, to me anymore, natural once you change it from one form to another. Unless you actually do an extract, you know, like I mix mine with a little vodka and do a little extract on it. <laughs> okay, now, okay, now. You mix the stevia leaf with vodka? That's how I do all my herbal extracts. I mix it with vodka and let it sit under my sink for several weeks. Then the, the alcohol, of course, evaporates. Yes, over a period because, of time. Because I know you don't drink alcohol. It's no, why no, I'm like, drink. okay, now, no. wait. <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's a very small amount because you, it's diluted. So like, if, if you buy a tincture from the health food store, you turn it over, it's going to tell you it's like 1% or 2% grain alcohol because the uh, components of the herb is extracted with the alcohol. So you can do, there's some things that are water soluble, but there's some things that are not water soluble and you need either alcohol or oil to extract those components. So when I make my extracts, I mix a little vodka, some water, I mix the herb, heat it up a little bit, put it under my sink for a few weeks, and then you have your tinctures. So I make tinctures and and extracts all the time. Wow. That's how you sent me those tinctures that you sent. Yes. Thank you for the hard work. I appreciate you. (laughs) So I want to share something. This weekend, I went to a wedding, wedding of one of my, one of mine, you know, Dr. Uh, sorry, Pastor Atoni Ulibmide's son. And there they did the Amala on this part. It looks so good. So I had a small bit of Amala. You know the Amala, in case you're not familiar with it, it's um, Dr. Jagwe, help me out. Yam flower. Okay. Yam flower, yes. Yam flower. So I had that with a soup called Begiri. Begiri is made out of beans, really pure. It's really beans cooked in water, basically. That's what I had this weekend. See, <laughs> so I, I, didn't, you, I didn't have the amla. I wish I had now. <laughs> we had that. It was so good. And then with jute leaves. Remember, um, Doctor Mike told us all the benefits of jute leaves. Ewedu, 
last week. It, it's a wedu in Yoruba, it's called jute leaves. And I had that with a little bit of sauce. The sauce they had there was with meat, so I didn't have the meat. I just had the sauce with it. It was so good. And I thought about it later and I thought, wait a minute, this is balanced. I had my carbs, protein, and fat in there. It was balanced. So that's a typical African meal. It's a typical Yoruba meal. I'm Yoruba. And that's typical for us. And so I wanted to share that, that you know what? We have this. Even here, we have it. And we still run after Western diets that are not causing us issues. But the que I still beg the question, though, why so much cancer also in Nigeria? I think I have an answer. But... <laughs> Dr. Gillum, what do you think of my dinner? I loved it. Sounds good. Dinner. You didn't bring me any, so, but, but I'll, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <laughs> so I brought that up really to say that this, there are so many things we can combine when we eat. So it just takes thinking about, okay, what do I get from this food substance? Like if you're eating brown rice with uh, vegetables and uh, think about it, your, how do you cook your vegetables? You probably put a little bit of oil and you know you put the, the veggies, the tomatoes, onions, these are all good for you. And you put plenty of those on your brown rice or, you know, we'll, I love jasmine. Uh, jasmine rice and basmati rice also I yeah, I uh, yeah um the good rice and you have a balanced meal because i think if we don't bring it home and discuss this you know specifics that we eat that we um yeah we most of it's available i mean and it's available and it's not expensive to eat that way you know, how, how much is, I mean, and even here in, in Sacramento, they have a West African store. So if I wanted to make amla or and beans and rice and beans and whatever, it's available here. So fufu. So Dr. Gillian, um, so my question is, uh, I think the topic is, is supposed to be uh, the incidence of um, diseases uh, based on the Western diet compared to traditional African diet. And so my question is, why is the lifespan of people in Africa lower than the people in the West, even though the people in the West eat um, terribly? Well, um, yeah, that was a question we had talked about. Yesterday, yeah, I just Yesterday. wanted to address it for the yeah, audience. When we talked about the availability of healthcare, like here, we talked about my, I had mentioned the fact that my daughter was born one and a half pounds at birth. If she had been born someplace else, she probably would not have survived because she was able to go to the NICU for 10 weeks after birth. To, to her, her weight was uh, high enough for her to survive. If she had been in a lot of other places, she wouldn't have survived because they don't have a NICU, first of all, a neonatal ICU, and they don't have the facilities that we have here that would take care of a preemie baby. So we talked about healthcare and availability of healthcare um, that we have here. So, but I think part of it too is um, they average. In, in other countries, they average like newborns or babies that a lot of the deaths are babies because they don't have the facilities to um, take care of a baby that may have come into the world with issues. Like my, my middle son had a tracheotomy. If he had been someplace else, 
they may not have, he, he had uh, what's called tracheal malaysia. If he had been someplace else, he may not have survived after nine months because the, the tracheal malaysia, they found out about it nine months old. So he may not have survived because they don't have the facilities to address those type of issues that may come up with a child. So the average between new, newborn deaths and people that are older people, you may find more older people in Africa than you do here, but because they average between the older people that live forever and the babies that may, not, may or may not survive, you're gonna get a lower um, longevity rate. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Okwayemi, all the way from Nigeria. It's in the middle of the night here there now. It's well, it's morning over there. Um, as a comment, I'm sure it's a comment or a question. You raised your hand. You can unmute. Dr. Okwayemi, great. Um, thank you. Good morning. Very much. Good morning, <laughs> Good morning to everybody. Good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, with respect that the question the last uh, speaker raised he uh, made me to make this comment. Um, I quite enjoy the presentation and everything that has been said before now, and I'm also looking forward to comment by um, Papa Mike Oye. The, what I want to say with respect to, in addition to that, yes, the environment, the health system is very, very important. But more importantly, in Nigerian system, the, the concept of um, sugar consumption and our and the lifestyle, in addition to the inability, in, inadequate um, standard health system, actually may contribute to what we are having. What do I mean? For example, the, we know that sugar is addict, addictive. And a lot of the, when you are talking of uh, the in, introduction of uh, sugar in diet, is a common thing. It's more common, I can say, in Nigeria, even than US. And the the quality of diet that people get to, to eat is not, is, is more majorly, um, majorly um, composed of sugar. Now, this issue of sugar has something to do with the changing of the bacteria system in our, in our guts. And this bacteria, are so mostly favored, they, 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 they like the sugar. Uh, some, they, they like, they produce uh, acids. So the sugar will lead to acids. These acids have been found to favor cancer. The, 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 the cancer loves sugar. So they love, by the fact that this environmental factor the the um, the sugar consumption, all we modulate and change the, the 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 kind of bacteria that we have in our gut system, and it takes it can take a lot of time, a lot of ten years, fifteen years for some of these things to show up. Eventually, that will become cancerous, and by the time it becomes cancerous, the uh, what I mean by cancerous, that the, the cancers are being, cancer cells are being formed now. It's for it to change, go back to the normal, um, normal LD bacteria. It it will take a miracle for such a person to be bounced. I mean to bounce back to normal um, health. So those these are uh, the lifestyle, the the environmental foods. That we have. That's why the fact that we have African traditional African diets that are good for health. Yet it's not everybody that is actually consuming it as um, optimally. So these are the contributions that I just want to make with respect to the 
increasing incidence of um, of an increasing mortality in Nigeria compared to other countries. Our food have been have been popularized. Drink, look at drink, for example, we have it plenty. Sugar sweeteners are so plenty in our in our in, in our food system. Thank you very much. Wow, thank you so much. This is one of the beauties of Medical Mondays with Dr. O, because that's Dr. Koyemi all the way from Nigeria himself, living in the culture and able to educate us on the lifestyle change that has occurred in the community, in the society that is negatively impacting the society. It's negative lifestyle change. It is true. Um, a lot of things are also imported now into Nigeria. We, I, we experienced that in Ghana. When I tried the chicken, I'm like, whoa, what is this? They say, oh, it's imported, really. Um, so Western diet has infiltrated the, the societies. And not only that, um, not only, not only that Western diet has infiltrated the community, Dr. Gillam was sharing fast food places and all that she sees all over these places. What do you think they sell there? It's, you know, um, Western diet. What now compounds things in our community, in our society, like in Nigeria, is the healthcare system. Look, I just went to Luth and Naima which is the Nigerian Institute of um, Medical Research, state-of-the-art institutions. The doctors there are phenomenal, top-notch doctors. I mean, equipments were state-of-the-art, up-to-date, just totally equipped. But do people access the care? Let me give an example. Say somebody has burning when they urinate, they go into the bathroom a lot. They can hold urine, urinary tract infection. Here, if that happens to someone, they run to the doctors or they run to the emergency room. They get given antibiotics for three days and it clears it up. In places like Africa, they may not seek healthcare. They may hold on to it. They may think, okay, this is going to go away or start using things that will not clear the infection and before you know it they may get septic what does that mean the infection can go from the bladder now go all the way up it can damage the kidneys it can it will lead to death because they can ask they they can't access health care for whatever reason finances or they don't believe in it so we need a lot of education we have the um the appropriate diets. We need to educate our people back home that they are actually good food. Sugar, like our doctor, like our doctor just said, is huge. If you've never tried um, Fanta, you know these sodas in in Nigeria, at least I know. I've not drank sodas in I don't know in over ten years. I don't know, fifteen years, but. In the days I used to, they sweeter in Nigeria than here. They have lots of sugar and it's not good for us. So all of those things contribute to uh, the average lifestyle being lower than over here. I'm sure there are other contributors that do that cause that. Thank you so much, Mr. Daudu. You always ask those deep probing questions. Thank you. Um, Dr. Maureen? Please unmute, you have a question. You're still muted, you're muted. Uh, you say, what call a house is. Uh, just one second, let me, let me mute. There you go. You can unmute. Dr. Maureen? Yeah, where are you? At home. Okay, now we see you. <laughs> yeah, when I lived in Nigeria in the 70s, people hardly used sugar. 
it was something and chocolates and all of that were very foreign to Nigeria. Now the Western diet has infiltrated. But I just wanted to add last weekend, I went to the Jollof Rice Festival and I had, apart from the tasting of that, I had a nice meal of um, cassava leaf and brown rice, which is Sierra Leone. And it was excellent. It had everything I needed, no meat. And I had all my protein from it. So I just want to tell you all about cassava leaf, which is very much a Sierra Leonean dish. Fantastic. Thank you so Thank much. You. And it was tasty, wasn't it? You said oh, very tasty. If it's done right, very tasty. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Spicy too. Mm. Mm -hmm. Those peppers are great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Okwayemi wrote in the platform that abuse of antibiotics is also a major issue in Nigeria that affect health. That is true. Medications are so easily accessible. It's incredible. Prescriptions are not needed in most pharmacies to get medications in Nigeria. And that's a problem, probably in other African countries too. And these are the things that impact health negatively. There are, I'm sure there are other confounding factors. Again, thanks for that question, sir, Mr. Dawudu. So at this point, I want to bring Dr. Mike Oye to um, comment on my, <clears throat> my, last, my notes from last week <laughs> to tell us- Well, Dr. O, <clears throat> the, the notes were very good. Thank you, sir. They were very precise. Where are Just you, a, sir? a few you comments. Sir, where are you? I mean, can't you see me? No, no. we can't see you, sir. We see the Bible and the door. We are seeing your door. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Turn your camera now. Okay, okay. Um, we're, uh, not, we're not seeing anything now. Oh, what happened? Now it's dark. Can no, you hear dark. me? Yes, sir. Uh, well, okay. if you can hear me, that's all right. Okay. Um, where you have written name, name. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You need to correct it, put it in its old position. You have put it in a bracket that um, says it's another plant, you know. Name. What, what Are you looking at it? Yeah, what plant is that, sir? Name. Name, name is Dogoyaro or Azadiracta indica. Hmm. Azadiracta indica. Okay, sir. S separate it from the other plant where you have put. Name. Can you see it? Yes, sir. Good. Um, then, secondly, we spoke about. Dandelion, dandelion. Yes, sir. For constipation. Uh -huh. it's, it's for both kidney and um and the liver. Um okay, sir. I think I did that. Okay. I'll then go I mentioned I mentioned um thistle, milk thistle. Okay. Milk thistle, I didn't see that in the list. It is there, sir. It's still there. Is it for liver? It is in the list, sir. Yeah, but it's for liver and kidney too. Yes. Not okay. only kidney. Okay. In fact, it is more for liver cleansing. Yeah. Okay, sir. Then the spelling of ageratum is A G E, not A G A. Ageratum conizoides. A-G-E, not A-G-E. Okay, sir. Otherwise, everything you captured was very good. Thank you, Well sir. done. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you, sir. I tried to get you to correct that before I sent it out. But since I couldn't track you down and it was, fr it was getting to Friday, I needed to keep my word. So everybody <laughs> on the platform, I apologize. I just wanted to keep my word. It was getting too too late from Monday till Friday. Was why I sent it out and say, you know, 
we'll so have it, it connected is here. Is it on WhatsApp? No, it's by email. Oh, it's email. You, you didn't get it? Mm -mm. Okay, I am there now. I'll make sure you get it. Okay, thank you. And I will make I those corrections. Everybody well. look out in your email. I'll make the corrections and send. Doctor, can you um, Doctor, can you ask the doctor how do you consume this dandelion? Um, sir, dandelion, sir. How do you consume it, sir? I try to eat it fresh and it's, it's bitter. It's very bitter. It my, it's, that's why it's good for the liver. <laughs> the leaves are bitter, but you can use yeah. that for salad. The roots are I put good it in my to make salad, tea. Yeah. yeah. Make tea with the root, dandelion root. Okay. Yeah, because we get it in, fresh. In case, yeah. in, case people in, in case people in Nigeria don't know it, the Yoruba name is Nyani. 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 So, but, but do you cook it? Do you cook F4 it? Uh, yeah, is cooked like a four. Just yeah. cook it like a four. Yeah, you can cook it. It grows but it wild like here. a bitter, like a bitter leaf. If you cook mm -hmm. it in soup, then. slightly bitter, slightly bitter. Yeah, <laughs> it grows wild in our grass here. People spray it to get rid of it. <laughs> yes, that's true. It, it grows wild in California. Yeah, <laughs> it grows aggressively. Yeah. <laughs> the roots can be six feet mm -hmm. deep. That's yeah, both the root, both the root and the leaves are yes. wonderful. The root can go very far. Yes. So the dandelion, I, um, oh. sir, you were actually here with me when I got some of those that I plugged in front of the house and boiled it, and just drank it like that. You remember that, sir? Yep, I do. So I boiled it and just drank it. So you can do it that way too. And it wasn't that bad. It wasn't that bitter. It wasn't that bitter. But the root is not as bitter as the leaf. No, this is the leaf. It was the, the leaf. leaf I, yeah, yeah, the root is less bitter. Really? Yeah, it's less bitter than the leaf. And the root is even more effective. Yes, it's more. Yeah, because like I said, it goes six feet deep. So it's getting nutrients from the soil all the way down to the no, but you don't get the roots, or you can get the roots in the store, though. Do you? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. Yeah, you can buy the dandelion root. I have some in my kitchen. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're for everything, You know, you know, Masha, Masha, Masha is in your neck of the woods, sir. No, she got everything. <laughs> so uh, I have Mr. to come to your kitchen. Yes, <laughs> she's in the neck of your woods. You have to, you have to go see her. <laughs> uh, Mr. Okusonya, sir. Welcome, sir. You were going to say something, sir. Were you going to say something, sir? You are muted. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, sir. No, I just said I, I don't have the note. So, you mind if you email? I don't have it. Absolutely. No, I no. appreciate it. Thank yes, you. Sir. Yes, sir. We'll do, sir. So, I have some questions in the in the chat box. And sir, this is good because you'll get the corrected version <laughs> when I email it. Um, somebody is asking, sir, asking um, Papa Mike Oye to tell us what bitter cola Orobo does for us. Mm. Orobo bitter cola, sir. Mm. Yep, I have a, I have some right here. <laughs> you have Orobo? <laughs> I know. Uh, I bought it. Uh, I don't know about two, three months ago. And okay. they look fresh. Oh, told you. If yeah. You, if you need the robo, I have a lot. I bought it. From, <laughs> yeah. Really? I have a lot in my fridge. Oh wow! So, Papa Mike, sir, tell us what the robo does, sir, because I want to ask my brothers to send some to me. You are muted, <laughs> sir. You are muted, sir. Orobo is a nervine, nervine. Now, a nervine is like food supply to the nervous system. Um, when it is eaten or chewed, it activates the whole body. It's a stimulant. So the metabolism is raised. It can keep a person alert. 
It affects the brain power. It reduces weight. Ah. It helps libido. Yeah, so it's along that line. Fantastic. If somebody is um, um, if somebody is suffering from hypothyroidism, it will help that person. Hmm. What about hyperthyroidism, sir? What helps that? Exactly. Exactly. Well, hyper, yes, it should be something that is a relaxant, like uh, the plant I mentioned the other time, um, Iggy fruit, fruit. Almond, almond. Almond, Indian, Indian almond, the leaves. Indian almond from Nigeria. Yeah. Indian <laughs> almond leaves. So and then, uh, and then passion, passion flower. Really? I didn't know that. <laughs> so, I didn't passion know flower, <laughs> both the leaves and the fruit. Wow. So, do you do do you drink that as as tea, sir? The passion flower. Yeah, you can take the leaf as tea. You can take the fruit um, as um, as what do we, what do we call it? As a drink, you know. Yeah, passion fruit. The fruit is like an orange. You can squeeze the juice and add water. Yeah. That means you make it into a juice. Yeah, I planted one of those in my yard. It, it only produced a few fruits this year. <laughs> then another one fruit. which is good for, for high pop, another one which is good is um, stinging nettle. Stinging nettle. So one is, that other a, is that a double T, sir? Stinging nettle. Yes, N E T T L E S. L -E. Mm -hmm. So how do you how do you prepare that? How do you eat that, sir? You use the leaf. You use the leaf. Use make a tea. Tea. Okay. Cool. Brother Mike, the old, the bitter cola also suppresses uh, appetite. What? The bitter cola. I yeah, you are, you are correct. Yeah. Yeah, it suppresses appetite and it's like cola, normal cola. Okay, got it. So it makes yeah. sense that it will cause weight loss. Yes. Wow. Yeah, it's good for weight loss. You know, my sister that asked that question, thank you so much <laughs> for asking that question. That was loaded. So, Auntie Tawa, you have some address, sir. Prisma. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Good how, evening. how many of these um, bitter cola do we have to eat a day to get all this? Um... <laughs> no, not too much. <laughs> <laughs> Everything must be done with moderation. Everything okay. must be done with moderation. Even water, which is good. If you overdrink, you are in trouble. So, what okay. is moderation, one or two? Or Maybe about a quarter. I think a quarter is probably enough of half. No, you can you can eat a whole one. Oh yeah, you, you can eat a whole one per day. Per day, sir, a whole one per day. Yeah, per day, per day. Yeah, you, you is probably there a eat it over. If you eat more than one per day, yeah, no, <laughs> but it shouldn't be it shouldn't be continuous. You will not be able to sleep. That's probably why. You, you, because oh, really? it's, it's, it's got caffeine in it, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah, is it, is it it's also a stimulant. Good, is it also good yeah. for diabetes? I know some people. Um, yeah, it is. Okay. It is good for diabetes because you are burning more energy. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Wow. Excellent question. So, sir... You should not unmute. You should you should not mute yet because he asked the question. He said, "Is there any health benefit to roselle plant ishapa?" A lot. 
that's one of the highest plants, I mean, the best, one of the best plants containing a lot of vitamin C. So it's a powerful antioxidant. It's a hibiscus, right? Yes, it's hibiscus. Hibiscus subdarifa. Okay. Yes. Rosel hibiscus subdarifa. Yes. Yeah. Subdarifa. Yes, yes. They also call it, that's what Google call it. I um, actually have um, experience with hibiscus. I went to Boden House in, in Ekiti, in southwest Nigeria. And most people, they substitute it for their meat. You know, uh, they don't have as much money to buy meat. And um, when they eat their meal, um, it's, um, there is... Yeah, you are correct. The four months meat. Yes. So how do you substitute um, hibiscus for meat? They cook it in soup or? Yes. Really? You, you use the calyx. You use the calyx. Right. The overgrown calyx. Yes. Right. And you use it for ishakwa. You make this ishakwa soup. Mm -hmm. It's because the, uh, the calyx are chewy when cooked. Yeah, it's very chewy. And it's so is it chewy? Uh, nature that makes people believe that if you don't have real uh, pro animal protein, you could just be chewing the shapa and it would be like you are chewing meat. So mm. that's one of the uh, exactly. reasons why that they substitute it for protein, animal protein in their soup. Hmm. So it, it's rich in vitamin C. So yep then it will ward off um, upper respiratory infections, colds and stuff like that. Is there anything else that it does? High fiber. <clears throat> high fiber. High fiber, so it prevents constipation. Yes, high fiber and then the chlorophyll uh, contributes to uh, reducing uh, the iron deficiency in the human body. <laughs> Lowers the blood pressure. Lowers yes. oh, blood pressure. It's, it's good for lowering the blood pressure. And, and the, the, the Hispanics call it Jamaica. Yes, Rosario de Jamaica. Yeah, or Sorrel. So is that the same as the, the Jamaica uh, drink? Mm -hmm. Rosario de Jamaica. Except they, use yeah. a, they put a lot of sugar. So Correct, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it defeats the purpose. <laughs> yeah, so I make mine with no sugar. Mm -hmm. No sugar. Just uh, precocce and cloves and cinnamon mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, guinea pepper. And, <laughs> yeah, and it's also the Sobo drink. Like yeah, yeah. Zobo, that Zobo. is Zobo. No, Zobo is the red one. The, the red, red one. one yeah. The red yes. petals. Mm. The red petals. So, so yes. um, Auntie, Auntie Busola George, I sent you the email. Check your email, Medical Mondays. So, oh. but I'm going to resend anyway because I'm going to um, update what Papa said. Oh, thank you and, so much. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. And, and Auntie, you put dandelion in your smoothie. That is fantastic. See, that's oh, something I, I learned I, now. That's how to drink. It's bitter. No, but if you put it in this in your smoothie with, with, and you have things like pineapple, thing. sorry. Right. Yeah, you yes, have your sweet there. Yeah. It's fine. Well, I'll try it's it. Not <laughs> it's not bitter. It's not yeah. bitter. She says it's not bitter. And I can imagine how if you have your natural sweets, like things like uh, pineapple, apple, you know, uh, blueberries and yeah. stuff like that in there. And then you put the dandelion, um, then it may not be bitter. I'm going to try it. <laughs> you can so, dry you can dry it and use it as tea. Ah. You can also use the root. You um there's a drink that you can buy. I think it's called um Inca, or it's another drink too, where they use the dandelion root that's been roasted and mix it with chicory and make a, a coffee. It tastes like coffee. So it's it's made from dandelion root. Thank you so much. I have uh, Sister Titi Lola Idu working for raising a hand. Kindly unmute. 
on mute, please. Thank you. Sorry, I, um, I forgot to lower my hand. I was going to say Zobo and um, Ishapa and Okro are all in the same family. They no, they are not the same. Family. Yeah. Okra is different from Ishakma. Yeah. Okay. They are of the same family, Malvis the, guy, but they yes, are different. Sir. Okra is in the same Ila. family, sir. I said they are in the same family, sir. Oh, okay, okay. They are. Yeah. Sorry, I studied agriculture. That's why I'm so emphatic that, uh, uh, about <laughs> it. <laughs> sorry. No, don't be sorry because you're, you're right. Papa just said yes. They're in the same family, but they are different. Yeah. What about what about Ifini? Oh yeah. She, they talked about Saint, it. Saint Lee. That's Saint Lee. Thank you. Ifini is the sweet basil. Eh? Sweet basil. Sweet basil. Yeah, it's a basil. It's a basil. Uh, sweet basil. It's for high blood pressure. It's for diabetes. It's for all forms of inflammation. It's good for the gut. You you may also say that's toast. It's good for it's good for respiratory problems. It's a, a, a theory in the dry form, or must it be the fresh form? In any form. Any form. <laughs> You talk, is I, it, are you talking about holy basil? Holy no, basil? It, no, no, it's the basil it's from Africa. It's uh, it's called uh, uh, scent leaf local. But it's the same family with holy basil. Yes. Okay. It's the they, same family. Okay, because I know they call it Tulsi. In, mm -hmm. in, in uh, India, they call it Tulsi. Their properties are the same. Mm, okay. I think I think the easiest thing to do for most people is unless you have these plants growing in your backyard, your best bet is to get, I mean, to source the plants and dry them and grind them into either flakes or powder. Then you can have them for a long time uh, to use. Uh, that's what I do. Well, that's what I love about California. Most of that you can grow here because we do have a nice long growing season. Basil and holy basil and pineapple basil will grow here. Hey, so, again, isn't this amazing that we have so much in our corridor that can help us prevent adverse conditions, adverse issues? I will again update on what we did last week, but don't get used to it because I'm not gonna be doing it all the time. <laughs> so I'm going to update and send it to you. If I don't have your email address, kindly, you know, send it to me. Um, you can private chat me. You can, you know, um, put it on the chat, chat box. I have some already. I would include you. I'll make sure you get this. Um, I still have some questions in the chat box. And I think um, someone is asking the, what about tamarind? What about tamarind? Tamarin? Vitamin C. It's very rich in vitamin C. Tamarind is not very common. It's, uh, it's, it's in the Sahel mainly. It's where, sir? But, but the, seeds, the seeds are pro proteinaceous. Anti-cancer. Sorry? Anti-cancer, anti-diabetic. That's what she was saying. 
So tamarind is anti-cancer. Yes, rich source of antioxidants, heart and health, it. cholesterol, protects the liver, antimicrobial. Because we have a lot of Hispanics here, Mexicans and Central Americans, we get a lot of, you can find them in the stores here. Yeah. Tea, you can make it as a tea or make it as a Greek like the Soro. They make this uh, tamarind tea. We used to suck it. We used to suck on it mm -hmm. and throw away the seeds. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the, the flesh haven't dried up, uh, is sweet and sour. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can suck on that. And uh, I know that it definitely has pretty high content of vitamin C. Mm -hmm. So um, Sister Faith wrote here that Living Well Store has it on their shelf. So what about sandalwood, Osu? Is it good for the skin, Osu? Sandalwood. Or calm wood, some people call it calm wood. Calm wood. Sir, Osu, sir, is it good for the skin? I don't know much about sandalwood. Osun. It's called Osun in Yoruba. Also, the red, that red thing they use for beauty. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, uh, it's been used uh, for, you know, centuries in the, in the Yoruba land. So um, they, they used it for skin beautification softening of the skin and uh, they believe it makes the complexion clear. When you see a lot of uh, Yoruba people that have clear black skin, no blemish, no pimples, nothing. Most of them use uh, Osu as part of their beauty regimen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank now, you. Oh. Some people are, some people are, are you not talking about Tiro? Tiro. Oh, no, 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 not Tiro. Not Tiro. No, this. Osu is red. Tiro is black. Osu is, is usually sold as liquid, but it's, ex, it's extract from a plant, which is a calm wood. Okay. So, so the liquid extract from the leaves and maybe from the bark as well as the root is what people buy as liquid. Now some people are incorporating it in soaps. So for instance, uh, there's some soaps that you can customize and then you ask them to put all kinds of things in your soap and uh, including also as well as other uh, plant-based products. So that th those are available for the skin, yes. It also calms in the mind and relieves anxiety. I was just reading something about it. Huh. How do you use that to calm the mind? You can use the oil and you can use it as in the infuser, the oil. Uh, well, I know that for the babies, they mm -hmm. use Osun for the mm -hmm. babies to rub calm their the body. Mm -hmm. And when I was young, my grandma used to ask us to rub this um, stick together. It's also an awesome stick. Mm -hmm. And we rub it and we get our awesome dead. And we rub it on ourselves. So again, you say it calms the mind. Yes, it's good for anxiety. For anxiety, if it's used as an infuser. What about on the skin, when it's used on the skin? I bet some of it will be it could be, it could be absorbed, yes. It will yes, be absorbed, through the skin, yeah. yes. Because usually like uh, Madam Tara just said, when they use it for babies, uh, they expect them to sleep well. So they most of the time will use it on newborns at night, as well as in the morning. And when those babies sleep, they, they sleep well. So it does have some calming effect on the babies. Um, Sister Tinu said, that was her regimen in law school that do do also, 
even imperial leather mixed with honey and can wood. And uh, she said, no wonder older people are, are what? Really, really have anxiety. Anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow. So this has been awesome. Dr. Gillon, thank you again for, you know, an awesome time of education. Um, by the grace of God, we will maintain good health so that we'll live, you know, abundant lives. When else, when somebody is deprived of health uh, or else, everything else just, uh, just fades. So I'm encouraging us to eat our food as medicine and not eat medicine as food. That we should take this cue and, you know, do an overhaul of lifestyle changes uh, so that we can live, you know, uh, prosperous lives. Thank you so very much for another amazing Medical Mondays with Dr. O. If there are no more questions, I wanna thank um, Dr. Gillum, uh, Dr. Mike Oye, uh, Doc, Mr. Doherty, uh, Mr. Daudu, uh, Auntie Tower, Dr. Ajagbe for their great contributions tonight. So, uh, but before we round up, I'm going to, you know, have Dr. Gillum give us, you know, um, some, you know, the uh, our parting words. However, they, I beg your, your indulgence because uh, Dr. Okweyemi just wrote, the idea of Bogo Nshe is real. Bogo Nshe means, and if I didn't interpret well, please help me somebody. Bogo Nshe means um, something that cures everything. She, it says the idea is real, that he knows that metformin is anti-carcinogenic. Are you talking about metformin glucophage? that is used to treat diabetes? Dr. Okoye? Yes? Um, we can't hear you. Yes, of course. Metformin, you believe it's anti-carcinogenic? Yes. Do you know what? I want to agree with you. Go ahead. Um, and um, somebody with diabetic can go to develop cancer. So if one of the drugs that they use for diabetic is metformin, and metformin has been found to revert some cases of um, um, dangerous cancer. So it's, you can, you can read, you can, but it's that, those are the things I found out. Thank you. Well, thank you. I believe that because now we see, we didn't know before that diabetes is linked to cancer. And we know about metformin. Metformin is still the, the it's still where we start the treatment of uh, diabetes. We, you know, the, you know, the first line of treatment when we diagnose somebody with diabetes is, you know, metformin is what we prescribe. It helps with weight loss, you know, also, it's, it's, it's a great drug. And, you know, I, I believe that. So um, there are lots of appreciation on the, on the forum, you know, saying thank you, appreciating all contributors. Um, thank you. So <laughs> Sister Shadi said um, that all mind blowing, amazing remedies we have in Africa. You got that right. Amen. And amen to that. Um, we need to revisit this once in a while to remind ourselves and uh, to utilize them the way they should. So Dr. Gillum, please give us your uh, parting words. Well, there was a, a question that talked about, these are great, that's from a therapeutic nomad. These are great traditional foods, but what if they are grown as GMO? So that's why um, when we have our session on uh, organic versus conventional, if it's GMO, then they're supposed to tell you, but many times they don't. 
So that's why it's a good idea as much as possible to eat organic, as much as possible to eat local, as much as possible, don't eat imported foods and eat in season. Because most of the time, if you're eating food out of season, it's imported from someplace else, like watermelons in December or watermelons in February. They're imported from Mexico here in California. So as much as possible to eat local, in season, and organic. That way you don't have to worry about GMO, genetically modified, because as, as far as, or as much as the farming industry here, a lot of things are winked at, they do have strict rules about organic. And they do have stricter rules about what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. Whereas some other countries on our borders, they don't have as strict a rule or as, as strict an oversight as they do here in the States. So organic, non-GMO, eat, eat African food, but make sure it's not GMO. <laughs> eat, or eat organic as much as possible. But I, I just wanted to address that because I saw that question in the uh, Thank you. Chat that's, box. A, that's an important one. Uh, Dr. Ajay said, just for laugh, is Dr. Gillon camera organic? Is my camera organic? <laughs> it might be. <laughs> I got it from uh, <laughs> HP, <laughs> HP organic. <laughs> All right. It's not GMO. It may not be organic, but it's not GMO. <laughs> Thank you all. You know what? Uh, just, you know, I, I wanted to say something and it, it almost escaped me, but I'm glad that I remembered. You guys have heard that monkeypox is around mm -hmm. and it has penetrated the United States that United States now have the greatest number. There's something that my son sent to me on um, um, Twitter today. Uh, a guy at monkeypox and took a train, public commercial train. And a doctor was on the train and recognized that this was monkeypox rashes on the guy. So he said, you know, you should be quarantined. And he said, oh, that he was just coming from his doctor and his doctor just said he should wear a mask, that it's okay to be um, around people because it's a gay problem, that it's a gay um, uh, infection, uh, that it's men having sex with men that have, that get monkeypox. A lady was sitting next to the guy and the doctor asked if the lady was comfortable doing that. And she said, yes, that she's not, she's not gay. She's not, uh, she's, she, so it cannot affect her. Please, education is important. Monkeypox can be um, transmitted to anybody. Through, to anybody. Thank you. It can be transmitted to anybody. That's the number one thing. It's a, it, can, it can be transmitted through breathing, respiration. It can be transmitted through contact. Please, let's be aware. And um, if we see any rash, you know, you don't recognize it on somebody, stay away. Let's stay safe. Until we meet next week, please be safe. Coronavirus is still also very much around. Yes. Thank you. Well, Thank you very much. Thank you.